We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Welcome back. I hope everyone is uh, well rested. Uh, in October 1517, Martin Luther posted 95 theses for public disputation, drawing widespread attention to facets of the Christian religion deeply in need of reform. Over the years that followed, he and other reformers explored the work of Christ, the reality of grace, and the rule of God's word with a penetrating insight unrivaled in church history. This year, we celebrate the way in which God moved half a millennium ago through leaders such as Martin Luther, John Calvin, and other reformers to bring a greater alertness to the wonders of Christ, the greatness of grace, and the authority of the Holy Scripture. The Covenant College anniversary of the Reformation Lecture Series will feature six speakers with singular insight into the Reformation to encourage us to deeper thought and appreciation of our Protestant tradition. It's my privilege to introduce our first speaker in this series, Dr. Michael Allen. Uh, Michael joined the Faculty of Reformed Theological Seminary in Orlando in 2015 and serves as the John Dyer Tremble Professor of Systematic Theology and Academic Dean. Previous to his time at RTS, he taught Systematic Theology at Knox Theological Seminary and served as the Dean of Faculty. He is a prolific writer with interests that range widely over various topics of Christian doctrine and eras of church history. He's a teaching elder in the PCA, and he and his wife Emily have two sons, Jackson and Will. Will you please give, please give a warm Scots welcome to Dr. Michael Allen. Covenant, it is so good to be here, and to be here just after fall break, you're rested and you're happy. And as someone who teaches and speaks in a lot of places, I know we can't take that for granted. So it's good to be here today, and it's no doubt uh, a rush to get back to class, and I don't know where you've been going this morning. I don't know if you've had a, a seminar with Dr. Capic or a class with Dr. Jackson. I don't know if you're just getting over sleeping in and trying to get back into the rhythm again after being away for a few days, but what I can guess is something you've not experienced, and it's something that's actually strange in human history, and it's something that distances us from people like Martin Luther and John Calvin and Martin Bootser and the other great men and women in the 16th century involved in what we call the Protestant Reformation. And that's wherever you came from, whatever dorm or apartment, whatever class or cafeteria, you probably didn't walk past a graveyard this morning. And that's strange. And you probably come from a town, a suburb, a neighborhood, a city, where in your day-to-day -day affairs, you likely didn't pass by graves quite often. We live in a world and a time where the dead are ushered off. Shoot, we're so good that we often move them off in a way before they are even dead. We send those who are ill, those who are dying off into care, outside the home, away from our family. And where do most cemeteries get put today? far off in the fields where the land doesn't cost much and where we don't come across them very often. But people like Luther and students at the university in Wittenberg where he served would have walked past graves every morning as they went to study. I don't say this to depress you. I say this simply to point out something about our culture. We live in a day and an age where the past is in many ways moved far away out of sight, don't we? where perpetual reinvention is the order of the day. And if we're not careful as Christian women and men, we can ingest that and we can assume that. And that's why I'm so glad that you, along with brothers and sisters around the globe, are taking time this year to celebrate the Reformation by giving attention to what the Holy Spirit did in that time and place where people's imaginations and affections and their convictions and their practices were shaped by a renewed encounter with God's Word. And so it's my hope that this morning and just the brief time we've got, as we explore one facet of that, hopefully you and I can stand on their shoulders and see a bit further. Hopefully you and I, like the Christians who early on heard that letter to the Hebrews and we're told of the great cloud of witnesses that you and I too will be able to run the race set before us by learning of those who've gone ahead by seeing the outcome of their way of life, 
by knowing that they've taught us the Word of God and by imitating their faith in a fresh way here and wherever our Lord would take each of you around the globe in His kingdom. But that's a strange thing for us today, and that's a difficult task. I'm reminded of the Avett Brothers song, Tear Down the House, repeatedly lamenting the idea that we live in a world that tears down the house that we lived in, and that the result of that is that we don't know the name of people around us and we don't even know ourselves. And so it's well worth our time if we want to know ourselves, and as you're trying to imagine what God would have for you in life, if you want to know the names of those around you and you want to better know what's going on in the breadth of God's kingdom, that we would look at our house, that we would look at the Lord's house, the way in which He's worked in many places and through all centuries. And so this morning I want to look at one idea. Protestantism and the Reformation is known for a bunch of things many of which I know you talk about in classes and celebrate here from time to time. But one idea that's crucial is the place of the Word of God, the Bible. We sing the Bible, we pray the Bible, we preach the Bible, we read the Bible. We're so in, into this, we put the Bible on t-shirts and on placards. People can tweet the Bible. The Bible gets used here, there, and everywhere. And it's worth reflecting not on why we use the Bible in that way, why the Bible permeates Christian culture in its varied forms, but what promise is there in that? Is that just the way that your grandparents did it? Is that just the way that the giants of the faith in years past did it? Is that the equivalent of analog wisdom for a digital world? Or is there something unique and lasting that hopefully can give you deep and profound comfort and hope that God's Word holds promise and power and life and blessing for you wherever you find yourself. And so to explore that, I don't want to turn to Luther, though I, I trust you'll hear of Luther in other lectures. I want to turn to one of the forgotten texts of the Reformation. No one shows this thing love. It's the, it's the youngest child, you know, easily forgotten in the mix. It's a small text from uh, one of the very first Reformed Confessions of Faith, the year 1528, the town of Bern, they issued ten theses. They weren't quite as pompous as Luther, of course, cooking up 95 whole theses. They had a mere ten. And I just want to reflect on the first of those ten theses of Bern. It goes like this. The Holy Christian Church, whose head is Christ, is born of the Word of God, abides in the same, and does not listen to the voice of a stranger. It's my single favorite line from all of the 16th century. The holy Christian church, whose only head is Jesus Christ, is born of the Word of God, abides in the same, and does not listen to the voice of a stranger. And I think there's three truths that it's trying to alert you and me to. Three truths about the Christian life, about Christian mission, about being faithful witnesses in a world that makes that difficult then and now that I hope you catch. And the first is this, the Holy Christian Church has but one head. The only head is Jesus Christ. Head, of course, is a political term speaking to a leader. In church settings, we use different words. Pastor, elder, priest, minister, bishop, superintendent. The terms have ranged across the traditions and through the centuries, but we know the idea of spiritual leadership. And it's crucial to catch that when Protestants, and particularly when Reformed Christians, speak of the Christian church and her life, the very first thing we always say, the very first line of every book of church order, is that the head of the church is Jesus Christ. And it's very easy to misperceive that. It's very easy to take that to mean Jesus is the head of the church in the same way that a lot of people have their names on buildings around this and other campuses. Jesus is the head of the church. He, he was the entrepreneur who got things going. He was the benefactor who donated his own self. He was the remarkable figure long, long ago in a land far, far away who played a key role, and so we remember what he did as the prophet, the priest, and the king. But it's crucial to catch that while we do celebrate what he did in the first century, the church stands on the promise that He is acting now. You can look at one text that Luther was so 
taken with in his early years, just before the, the posting of the 95 Theses, he'd been studying and lecturing on Hebrews. And he saw in Hebrews this remarkable witness as we read from chapter 5 through chapter 10 that Christ dies once for all. So there's no more sacrifice that needs to be made. And Luther starts to see this is going to have effects on ways in which we think of our repentance as having some sort of sacrificial effect, continuing the atoning work of Christ in some way. And, and he celebrated Hebrews 1, verses 1 through 4, where it says, Christ, having made propitiation for sin, sat down. What a priest could never do, because he'd done that work. But what he saw, and what we have to not miss as people who celebrate the atoning work of Christ and the finished nature of our justification, is that Hebrews also goes on to say that Jesus isn't done it's not simply that Jesus was active in the first century and there's that great glorious past tense of the gospel, nor is it simply that there's a future that we can look to with confidence and assurance, not fear, because He will return and He will treat us as His own, and there's a future tense of the gospel. But Hebrews 13.20 says that He's the great shepherd of the sheep. Though there are many leaders, though there's a great cloud of witnesses, Jesus now is at the right hand of the Father to intercede for you when you feel too weak to call out to God. To pray for me when I feel overwhelmed with indecision and worry. That Jesus is my great pastor. I have, I have other pastors. I have other leaders. He sends them to me, but He stands above and He ministers on my behalf. And I fear that too often, too often in our celebration of the atoning work of Christ in the past tense of the gospel, we fail to keep reading, and we fail to see that there is grace for us in the present tense of the gospel, in the fact that Jesus is now head of the church. He is ruling and reigning. He is interceding, and He is pastoring each and every one of you. He promised He wouldn't lose His sheep. But there's a second thing that this statement goes on to say that the Holy Christian Church, whose only head is Jesus Christ, is born of the Word of God and abides in the same. We get the idea in this room, in this kind of place, at Covenant, in the, the Protestant and Reformed tradition, we get the idea that new birth is of God. Babies don't do much other than scream and whine. They come out messy and rather cranky. It is a gift that they receive life, and so it is for us spiritually. We get that. But do we catch that the same gift that God provides in spiritual birth, in bringing you from death to life in Christ, is matched by God's paternal care, God's fatherly care in sustaining and growing you? That God is going to gift you in just as miraculous ways to make it through life as gifting you with life itself. When I was in high school, I uh, played basketball. In my senior year, I decided to run track. And so I took to track, and my favorite event was the 4x400 relay, the last event of any track meet. And uh, it's pretty simple. Four people are going to run. You're going to pass the baton after each person has run one lap around the track. And I loved it. It was the last event. Oftentimes the result of the meet was hanging on the result of that race, and I, I really thrived on that kind of pressure. And uh, I liked the fact, frankly, that it wasn't the longest event I had to run. I'm, I'll confess there's a lazy bone somewhere in there in my body. Uh, but I also hated it. I hated it for just this reason. As somebody who'd grown up playing soccer and then a whole lot of basketball, Though it's a relay, it is not a team sport or event. I would stand there on the track, and I ran the third leg, and either the person before me would have a lead, and when they pass me the baton and I take off, it's my job not to screw it up for the next 50-some-odd seconds, or worse, we're behind, and it's my job to make up for the fact that somebody has been outdone. In either event, I'm running around and everyone is watching me and there is no one there to help. It is not a team endeavor in that regard. And that's why each and every time, as I anticipated it, I would always also throw up. I would, 
I would, I would grow nervous before the event, and I would throw up invariably 15 minutes before the race, and then I would go, and I would race, and I'd be delighted afterward. And that was frustrating. That was anxiety-inducing. That sense that there is no one to help you. And my hunch is, we all feel that spiritually, don't we? I mean, you feel that at times. Jesus took the first leg with the baton, and I mean, it was beautiful. He was rounding the corners. He was taking the flack when people started to gain on him. He was so consistent even to the end. He didn't really renege. He kept pushing through, and he finished so well, and he passed off the baton. And the apostles have fits and starts, and it wasn't all pretty necessarily, but they ran remarkably, and by the end, they're going at greater strength than in their youth and and their early days as disciples. And maybe there's another leg. Maybe mom and dad, maybe some pastor or youth leader, someone who played a key role in your life, they, they seem to be further ahead, and they seem to have witnessed and discipled and demonstrated something about the faith that seems pretty impressive, frankly, and now here you are. And you've got life ahead of you, and God will call you to contribute to communities, to take jobs, to take risks, to evangelize, to invest in various ways in blessing your neighborhoods and cities and watching out not just for those near but those far away. And it can feel, frankly, pretty lonely and overwhelming and isolating. And it seems to me that it's just that that causes us to clam up, isn't it? To cease to take risks, to cease to be bold, to dream big, to think about not just what would be the easy way forward or the logical next step, but what would God really be calling me to? What opportunity really presents itself? And the Reformation was a time of bold radicalism, of great missions, of remarkable evangelism, of investment in culture, in neighborhoods and families and cities, and radical economic provision for many immigrants displaced by a whole slew of political problems around the European continent. And they were able to do that because they had a very vivid sense that Jesus was not disengaged. It's not simply that he'd passed the baton and now it's on them to make it, to not screw it up, but that Jesus has power for them today. That's why Luther turned to one text in particular, time and again, to Romans 1, 16 and 17. And you probably famously know it for its conclusion. The just shall live by faith that Luther so heralded, that we are are justified by faith alone, not by works of the law. But Luther also treasured that first part of it, that he was not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because it's the power of God for salvation. Luther knew that just as much as God has grace to bring you into the family and to give you new birth as a Christian woman or man, so Jesus has power through His Word, through the gospel, to sustain you and to grow you and to send you and to use you to bless others. And that's why he was such a seemingly reckless man willing to, at great risk, follow Christ's call. There's a catch, though. Third element. The only head of the church is Jesus. He's not absent. He's active. He stands at our side. He goes before us. He watches over us. He has grace for today just as for your conversion day. And I hope you know that. And He he uses His Word that we could abide in it, that we could find strength, wisdom, encouragement, and comfort in every season. But you got to know something about God's Word and about the promise of Christ's grace. That when Christ saves a man or woman... He does not leave you as you are. And that means against the polite customs of our day and age, He will get all up in your business. It's not for nothing that Calvin and the other reformers treated the prophet as the great image for the person who is learning from and and professing the Word of God. And so Calvin would regularly look to Jeremiah 1 to describe the nature of the ministry of the Word And it's a remarkable picture of Jeremiah being called to go on a, frankly, thankless task to go preach the Word to people who won't be too happy about it. And he's told in Jeremiah 1.10 that he's to go with this Word and he's to do it to 
destroy and to overthrow, to pull up and to tear down, to build and to plant. And you've got to catch that. God's Word will build you. God's Word will plant you. God's Word is meant to bring about flourishing and wholeness, that word perfection that is used so much in places like Matthew 5 or Hebrews 5 or Ephesians 4. And it doesn't mean that you're, you're meant for sinlessness in this life, but you're meant to be a complete and whole Christian who bears the maturity of Christ being conformed uh, to Him. But the catch is, the way to maturity is the way of being confronted. And before Jeremiah gets to build and to plant, before he gets to reconstruct, there's that difficult work of deconstruction. There are six infinitives there in Jeremiah 1.10 of the goal of God's Word. And only numbers 5 and 6 describe positive rebuilding. Numbers 1 through 4 are all about the difficult work of getting down to the basics of the problem and rooting it out. Just like someone suffering from a terrible cancer isn't really going to be helped until chemotherapy has taken them all the way down that the root issue can be dealt with, that a, a transplant can actually be performed. Until you actually take down those defenses, you can't really get at the issue. You can get at the symptoms, you can get at the appearances, you can get at some of the feelings, but you can't really get at what's killing you until you deconstruct. And we can easily say, well, that's what happened to me before I was converted. God's Word told me that I was a sinner and I was on my way to hell. And we can so easily think that the Word, the living and active Word of God, according to Hebrews 4, well, well that cuts through and confronts and deconstructs the pagan. That helps me know that Hollywood's after me, that D.C., that Fifth Avenue, that they have evil designs that they want to win my heart and affections to the fears of this world or the lures of the devil. And no, no doubt that's all true. But we can too easily assume that we too don't need Hollywood or Madison Avenue or Washington, D.C. to in some way lure our affections away from Christ. And so another key text that Luther and especially Calvin treasured was found there at the beginning of Romans 12 where God calls for us to offer our bodies as living sacrifices, our true spiritual worship. And it goes on to say that to do that, we have to not be conformed to the patterns of this world. We have to throw a spiritual stiff arm to the ways that this world is, is trying and people who are brilliant and have a lot of resources want to make you want things that you needn't want. They want to make you fear people that you needn't fear. And so you, you don't get conformed to that. But it goes on and it says, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might be able to discern what the will of God is, what's true and good and perfect. We often think the problem's out there and we fail to remember with the reformers that I don't need the problem out there. The problem in here is plenty much enough and that the status quo is not acceptable, that Jesus' forgiveness of me is not Jesus being done with me but that the Word of God will get up in my business. It will challenge me. It will demonstrate places where my vision of neighbor is too small, where my sense of, of love's demand is far too comfortable, where my vision of God's glory is far too weak. It will explode those things. It will cut and it will hurt. And what better place to... Get used to that practice than when you're studying the liberal arts at a place like Covenant College. I remember the words of the Baptist philosopher Cornel West who will say that when you study the liberal arts, you come to learn how to die. And what he means is that you learn to see parts of yourself, those things that are false, bad, and ugly, those ideas that aren't humane, that aren't life-giving, you see them confronted. And I think we could go a step further and with the, the ten theses of burn, we could say that God's Word and the Gospel don't leave us to do that alone. It's not like you just need to learn to have a self-critical mind, though that's a good thing, but that you have the promise of a Lord who is alive and active at the right hand of the Father and who has sent out the Word of His prophets and apostles and that that Word is there to comfort you, yes, but it's also there to challenge you 
It is living and active, and it does cut right through. And that's why we speak of not only forgiveness and justification as one of the great gifts of the Gospel, but in the Reformed tradition especially, we celebrate the fact that sanctification, God transforming who you are through and through, is also a gift. It's a calling, but it's a gift. And that Jesus has not left you alone. He is not on vacation or sabbatical, but He is more actively involved in the transformation of you through and through than even you are than even you long or dream for. And His Word is His instrument. His Word is the means by which He does that. You know, the thing with grace is it can come in many places. If God wants to, He can speak through the mouth of the donkey. Go read your Old Testament. But if you want to know the comfort of the Gospel and you want to know the challenge of Jesus, the the wisdom isn't that you would go to the barnyard, but you turn to the book. You know, I'm reminded there are these shows, Storm Chasers. Any fans out there? These folks, these folks tra- you know, they, they chase down these tornadoes. Tornadoes can pop up anywhere, right? I remember growing up in Miami, there was a tornado that famously went through the skyscrapers of downtown Miami, and it was on every newspaper's front page the next day. Because that's really strange. We have our own problems, but we don't have that normally. Storm chasers are always in the same spots. They're always in Kansas. They're always in Oklahoma. They're always in the plain states known as Tornado Alley, because while a tornado can pop up anywhere, if you really know that you need to find them so that you can be on this loony show Storm Chasers, you move to those places. This is why we celebrate the idea of means of grace. That God and His freedom can reach you anywhere. God and His love can change you through many tools. But God and His fatherly care and Jesus as your great pastor has provided means of grace. His Word. So that going again and again to it, listening to sermons, meditating upon it in prayer, discussing it with brothers and sisters, using it to evangelize other people, we can find the comfort of the Gospel as well as the challenge of Jesus. We can be reminded of our justification and the freedom we have that frees us to go and be bold, to be self-sacrificial, to think of others' needs and not worry about ourselves so much. But we can also go to see the way in which it opens up a new way of imagining the world, a new way of seeing yourself. You know, in the Reformed tradition, we often talk about a later Reformer, Abraham Kuyper, who spoke when he came to the U.S. of the fact that there's not one square inch of this entire globe of which Jesus Christ doesn't say mine. And that's true, and we rightly celebrate the consequences of that for all of life. But I think the the Ten Theses of Bern And the Reformation insistence on the Word of God for developing whole and effective Christians should remind you and me to to maybe hear that in a slightly more personal tone. Kuiper's words can feel very big. So let me conclude with this. Jesus looks at you and there is not one nook and cranny of yourself. There is not one part of your person that He doesn't say is mine. And there's not one instance of your life for which there isn't grace and gift and a word to comfort and to challenge. Let's pray and ask that we'd turn there. Jesus, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You You've not left Your church. We thank You that the same power that raised You from the dead and that called the world into being will strengthen us and send us on Your mission, we pray. And so we ask that we would be women and men who would turn there in faith and repentance and that You would prove to be a God who would speak there with power and grace. For it's in Your Son's name we pray. Amen. Praise God from